Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to the live program number 173 at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is distinguished faculty, Dr. Chirag Berry from Cincinnati, Ohio. Dr. Berry completed his residence in India and moved to the United States, where he completed his fellowships at the Medical College of Wisconsin and the Spine Fellowships at the Mass General Hospital, Boston, and the Cincinnati Children's Hospital, Ohio. Currently, he's attending orthopedic surgeon and assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at the University of Cincinnati School of Medicine in Cincinnati, Ohio. Dr. Berry has several publications to his credit, and he has spoken about a lot of spine surgery topics all over the world. So today is my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Chirag Berry from Cincinnati, Ohio. Over to you, Chirag. Thank you very much, Tish, and uh, good morning and good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you for um, allowing me to uh, uh, give this talk. Um, so I'll be speaking on oblique lumbar and body fusion, or anterior to source technique, ATP technique, as some might know it as. Again, uh, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, all right, so let's see if I can, uh, yeah, here you go. All right, so historically, um, and tier approaches have been described. Now they've been described for more than hundred years now. So initially they were transperitoneal and uh, Mueller back in 1906 described this for tuberculosis. And uh, later Burns in uh, 1933 described it for L5S1 spondylolisthesis as you can see here. And Lane described it for this degeneration for levels anywhere between L3 to S1. You could see they have retracted this, this large uh, vessels over here to get to the front of the disc. Um, later, the ALF technique started to become retroperitoneal as we know them today. And these were still done in supine position initially by uh, Ito in 1934 for tuberculosis. Um, in 1944, Ivahara uh, for this degeneration. And later in 64, Harmon for degenerative instability. Now Harmon also described the retroperitoneal vein anatomy and variations. Now the variations are important even today as we do all of approaches. Then came the anterolateral techniques. Now these uh, and lateral techniques were the direct precursor of what we now know, know as the older for ATP approaches. So um, as most of us already know, these were first described by Hudson in 56 and 60 for tuberculosis. Later in the 70s and 80s, these were also used for pediatric deformities and trauma. So the thoracic abdominal approach is done in a lateral position. Uh, Transthoracic approach is extended anteroinferiorly into the retroperitoneal space. Um, technically, you're staying in front of the psoas at the lumbar levels, but you may have to retract or take down the psoas in the upper lumbar levels to perform instrumentation. Often the diaphragm is taken down if you're going high up into the lower thoracic spine. And uh, it's still used today for tuberculosis, scoliosis, and fractures. Uh, the big advantage being a wide open exposure uh, to allow uh, instrumentation at multiple levels in thoracic and lumbar spine. Now, then came the minimally invasive techniques. So the open antilateral techniques were extra source. And then people decided to try and do these minimally invasive through an oblique approach first described by Meyer in 97. And some also started describing it going through the psoas or the lateral interbody fusion, also known as direct lateral or extreme lateral or X-lift techniques, uh, starting in 2004 where Burgi described it for uh, through endoscopic techniques. And later Asgar and Pimenta described these uh, their technique called the x um, in 2006, where they would use um, a guide wire going into the disc and then you would place uh, dilators, tubular dilators to open up the space. Now you had to be careful with the lumbar plexus right behind you. So you would use neuromonitoring to keep this process safe. 
Then came the minimally invasive oblique approaches. As, as I mentioned, Meyer in 97 um, utilized a blade-based retraction system. You can just see it over here in the left corner. He used um, a square or a ring-shaped uh, retractor with blade-based retractor systems to reach levels above L5. Um, while this was going on, the X-lift techniques became more popular and uh, the direct translation was to utilize tube-based retraction system, which were described in 2017 uh, by uh, Woods and Hines, where you would just move your uh, retraction or uh, exposure system a little anteriorly and try to put in a wire and tubular retractors uh, and stay in the oblique trajectory, as you can see over here. Now, Sylvester in 2012 and Rosoli, they were the first ones to coin the term OLIF. In their paper, they described their technique and they use four Steinman pins and handheld retractors to expose each disc. And of course, Woods and Hines, when they presented their tubular retractor system, they did not recommend that for L5S1. So they used a blade-based retractor system for L5S1, as you see over here. And then finally, Tenori used a ring frame or a sin frame modification to um, uh, perform, uh, perform what they call as ATP or anterior resource technique at multiple levels, uh, including L5S1. So this is how we progressed um, the oblique approaches, um, initially described as blade-based retractor systems and also tube-based retractor systems. Now the tube-based, as they are direct translation from the transverse technique, they've been described for levels only above L5 and that too only from the left side for, for because of the wide anatomic corridor on the left. While the blade-based retractor systems are more versatile, they can uh, let you approach at uh, almost all levels uh, from T12 down to S1. And L5S1 uh, can be an advantage with blade-based retractor systems. Now, L5S1 can be approached going under the bifurcation where it's called OLIF 51 uh, as per the publication by Woods and Heinz in 2017. Or it can be lateral to the bifurcation or pre psoas or anterior to SOAS or ATB technique described by Tenori in 2019. We'll go over uh, a lot of these techniques in the next few slides. So this is the, the retractor system used by Tenori. And uh, this is one that I also often use. Um, you have a cadaver here in uh, a lateral decubitus disposition with the left side up. This is the sin frame. And it has a modification where it has uh, hinges at the top and the bottom over here, which allow this half of the ring to bend down towards the abdomen. And of course, the ring is held together by these rods that attach to the railings of the OR table to provide fixity. Now, Woods and Hines uh, utilized what they'd called as the OLIF 500 retractors, which is a Thompson modification, where you have a rod connecting to the table here, and then there is a curved um, frame with arms. And you can fold these arms down, and this is how it would look once the blades are in position. And uh, you have the option of add, adding a fourth blade here through this arm itself. So these are the positionings of different kinds of retractor systems. Of course, the tubular-based retractor systems is uh, uh, fairly straightforward and uh, depends on where, which level you're going at. So OLIF above L5 is fairly straightforward in that um, you have a wide anatomic corridor on the left side. As you can see here, um, there's a large space between the left psoas and the midline aorta. The, the aorta has a midline structure and the IVC is a right paracentral structure. So the space on the right is gonna be limited. The space is also gonna be limited lower down at L5 S1 level. So above L5, there's a wide corridor here that you take advantage of in OLIF. Uh, if you're treating only disc pathology and you're doing only interbody fusions, you often don't need to do any retraction or ligation of vessels 
you do not need to expose out the segmental veins unless you're doing a corpectomy or a major reconstruction. So this technique, the OLIF above L5 from the left, definitely has significant advantage over the, the transverse techniques. Uh, with the transverse techniques, uh, there's a high um, uh, worry about injuries to the lumbar plexus. And uh, because you're going through the source, uh, you want to make sure that you're staying away from the lumbar plexus by utilizing neuromonitoring. And neuromonitoring does not allow you to have muscle relaxation during surgery. So if you're doing OLIF, you can potentially not use neuromonitoring depending on your uh, uh, risk level. And you can employ complete muscle relaxation. Now, muscle relaxation is very, very helpful in any abdominal surgeries. It can um, increase or allow you to retract the psoas better. It can reduce the tone of your abdominal wall muscles and make uh, life very easy for, uh, for keeping the retractor systems in place. Now, of course, the OLIF technique and other advantages, you, the ribs and the iliac crest do not come in your way because you're going anterolaterally rather than true laterally. And uh, OLIF does have the potential ability to include L5S1, uh, but as we'll discuss later, this has a separate uh, technique and risks involved. Uh, and we'll talk about this later. So this is my preferred technique. Uh, I mostly go from the left side as it's been described and because there's an anatomic advantage but right-sided approaches are possible and I do them in rare cases, especially if a patient has had left-sided prior surgery and I anticipate a whole lot of scarring on the left half of their belly. Um, you can also use a right-sided exposure if you have a scoliosis with concavity to the right and that helps you uh, um, uh, address multiple target levels together. Uh, I use fixed lateral hip positioners. Um, I typically have a posterior hip positioner somewhere over here over the posterior iliac wings. And then I have an anterior um, positioner here, which is at the lower half of the sternum. Um, I might use additional tape over the greater trochanter to uh, provide more fixity to the lateral position um, in patients with uh, high body mass index. Then I do a lateral C arm to mark out my levels that I'm going to address with the surgery. And you can trace the S1 end plate anteriorly so you know how far inferior you may need to go if you're addressing L5 S1. Now you want to stay at least two finger breadths anterior to the iliac crest uh, or the ASIS for two reasons. One is there are a couple of nerves that go in here, the ilioinguinal and the iliohypogastric nerve that can potentially get injured or get involved in scar tissue as you approach. And secondly, staying away from the bony crest will allow easier uh, retractor blade placement. It won't fight with the bone uh, or during the procedure. Now the incision can be along skin lines, as you see here, to make it more cosmetic. And that can allow you still allow you to address multiple levels, or you can have an oblique approach if you are worried that you may not be able to reach all the levels that you want to with one incision. And that's uh, both kinds of incisions heal pretty well. Skin line incisions probably have a better cosmetic uh, appeal to it. So this is a small video I have of the muscle splitting approach. Let's see if it plays out. I'm gonna mute it for us. So I'm going through the skin here. Again, this patient is in the lateral position with the left side up and the left of our screen is cephalad and right is caudad. And I use my uh, uh, cut of the bovi uh, to go through the subcutaneous fat. And there is a deeper layer of fat uh, of, of subcutaneous fascia called the campers fascia that you will have to go through as well. Um, and uh, of course, some of those uh, level, uh, some of those uh, fascial layers can have vessels, especially in the lower uh, portion of the exposure. So that's the campus fascia that I'm cutting through. Eventually, you will start to see some brown tissue, and that's the muscle. I'm going to skip forward to some of it. Uh, 
So that's the brown uh, muscle tissue that I'm visualizing. That's your external oblique. I try to create a nice flap. Uh, creation of a nice flap will allow you to reach multiple levels by using this as a nice mobile window. Then I look at uh, where my uh, external oblique muscle fibers are going to be oriented. I cut through the fascia of the external oblique. Uh, try to cut the fascia in line with the muscle fibers. Now this, uh, this layer, oftentimes you can come across some vessels that you may have to be just be careful while cutting through it and uh, uh, thin it out as much as possible if needed. And um, so the lower half of the, of the external oblique here will be aponeurotic. Uh, and you can see the white portion uh, in the lower half, which I'm gonna show next. So this is the lower half, which is aponeurotic. So sometimes you just have to cut through it with the scissors. Uh, here is the cut that goes through it that you try to stay within the lines of the external oblique muscle. So that's external oblique that aponeurosis that you've opened up. Then you use closed scissors by doing a blunt dissection to open up the external oblique. Sorry about that. Now then is the internal oblique layer. You do the same thing. You try to open up the fascia of the internal oblique and then you spread it open. Um, you have to be careful. Sometimes you can have uh, a neurovascular layer beneath it and uh, you want to be a little gentle around it so you don't lacerate any of those veins. It's not a big problem. You can still ligate them, uh, but they can uh, just take a whole lot of your time while you're doing that. So you can see a small neurovascular bundle right underneath there, which I'm trying going to try and stay behind off. And then I have the transversus layer, the transversus abdominis. You want to split it as posteriorly as possible. And then I put my finger in and just run the finger down and reach the retroperitoneal space. Now, of course, everyone does this differently. Um, this is just my technique. And then um, it allows me to have a nice exposure. I kind of use my fingers to open up the muscle more. This part of the procedure is being done with handheld retractors. And then I use sponge sticks to push the peritoneum anteriorly and try and expose the source. Um, there you go. So eventually you find the source. You wanna be careful while you're placing the retracted there because there's usually a nerve on top of the, uh, the source, which is the genitofemoral femoral nerve. You try not to scrape on the source so that you can maintain a thin layer of fascia over it. I use a Yankauer suction tip that makes it easy for you to do blunt dissection. So I'm going to discuss some cases here. So this is a patient with uh, L3 to 5 stenosis. Um, L4 to 5 also has grade 1 spondylolisthesis. And uh, here over the axial section at L3, 4, you have to realize that uh, you have to uh, visualize that this source is pretty prominent here. And it seems to have attachments to your annulus throughout. And that's pretty common at levels L3, 4 and above. And you may have to take down some of these attachments to get or create this interval between the, the vessels and the psoas. You can see the aorta is already bifurcated here. Normally it's bifurcated at a much lower level, but you already see the round common iliac arteries here. This is the veins. Uh, at L4, 5, fortunately, there's not a whole lot of attachment on the annulus itself. So that makes the psoas very retractable. And um, uh, fortunately, in this case, the vessels kept on staying medial to where we were and L45 uh, exposure should have a good amount of corridor. So uh, this is the approach. Again, I'm gonna skip through the approach since we just saw it. So here I am, uh, I'm trying to put my retractor on the psoas and then I put a tiny retractor, a small retractor on the superior end of it. I'm not going all the way in. It's not pushing down on the bone, it's the superficial docking. And you can see the ureter here, just anterior to the psoas. That's the ureter over here. And this is the tendinous portion of the psoas. So I wanted to create that interval very carefully over here. Uh, I still use my sponge sticks to kind of create that uh, little tension over there. And then I advance my retractor so that I'm just retracting the psoas and not uh, injuring the ureter. The ureter is now retracted anteriorly far ahead of me. You can still see the attached portion of the source over here. And now you can see some of the annulus in front of the source. 
And that's the one that I'm going to clear off with, uh, with bipolar. I like to see the nice glistening uh, annular fibers uh, before I start doing the discectomy. So in this case, um, uh, this is how it eventually looked. You know, you can see the annular, the white annular uh, surface. I'm going to use a bovi to retract some of the muscle off out of my way. So you want to take off those attachments onto the annulus. You don't want to be at the level of the bodies here because you might end up going into the segmentals. So you stay at the disc level. Uh, you would know because you see the annulus and there's a bulge of the disc. And then I use a cup to just elevate the muscles back. And that gives me a nice one inch uh, breadth of annular tissue. This is where I'm showing the sympathetic trunk this is the sympathetic trunk that's just in front of my anterior blade. It's usually a cord-like structure that rolls left and right, and it's pretty fixed to your annulus. Sometimes you have to really struggle to get the attachment off if it's right in the middle of your exposure, which I'll show you next. So this is the uh, sympathetic trunk. So then I do my annulotomy. You want to uh, make sure that uh, all your important structures are out of your way. You want uh, a nice uh, convergence of the retractor blades. So uh, it's opened up at the incision level, but uh, uh, close enough at uh, the distal end so the bowel doesn't come in the way between their blades. Um, you do have to use carb elevators um, to try and take down the cartilage at the end phase. This is where I'm using cartilage uh, elevation with the carb elevator. A sharp L, uh, cob always helps. And then you do an orthogonal maneuver because you're entering the disc from an anterolateral trajectory. You don't want to go posterolateral on the other side that could hit the nerve on the other side. So you kind of move your hand up. So you're staying um, anterior, even on the opposite side or on the, on the right side of the disc. So, and then you take off all your disc material Kerosene's really help to thin down your ALL and get some of the hard to reach uh, disc portions uh, with the, your pituitary. The downgoing uh, uh, curette helps to, um, again, thin down the PLL and the ALL as needed. Uh, if it's nicely visualized, some people also try and do a direct decompression from the front. Although it's not extremely easy at all levels, depends on a lot on the opening of the disc and uh, the, the visualization of the posterior end of it. Here I'm putting a blunt spreader and kind of pierce through the opposite annulus. Again, these are the trials and I'm kind of doing the orthogonal maneuver as I enter. This is now the L45 level and um, I'm exposing it. Here you are going to see that um, the sympathetic trunk is right in my way. So I'm going to uh, go through some of its attachments to the annulus with the bipolar and try to move it out. You can see the white annulus there. So once I've gotten that attachment out, I can just move it ahead with carb elevator and create a nice one inch opening uh, for me to visualize the annulus and do a, a discectomy there. So I'm gonna run through some of these steps here. Uh, you do the discectomy, clear out the disc, put in the, the trials, and uh, eventually this is the cage that goes in. You, know, you can see some uh, vicral, tissue, vicral thread going across it because bone graft has been packed in there. So as you mallet it in, the bone graft can just fly out and you might end up with an empty cage going in. So I put some vicral in there and it gets absorbed eventually. And uh, once the cage is in, again, you every time you enter, you enter obliquely and then do an orthogonal maneuver and put your hand up as it goes toward the other end. I use a 15 degree lordotic cage. Usually that creates enough space between the cage and the ALL for me to put some more bone graft in. Sometimes you can just pack it in in front of the cage. Uh, just behind the ALL. I do not do a sharp dissection or taking down of the ALL. Uh, but uh, if it's a completely collapsed disc, I have at few in few occasions done a blunt rupture of the ALL. So this is how it looked after the front procedure. You can see nice uh, 16 um, height, anterior height cages at both levels. You can see the L45 listhesis is partially reduced. And then I put percutaneous screws from the back. So that minimizes the amount of muscle dissection from the back. This is how it looks um, right after the surgery.
I sometimes skip the levels if I don't need additional fixation or if I'm not over reducing my list thesis, uh, if it's not needed. This is another case. Now, uh, a lot of times when I'm doing uh, these techniques, I would just keep the C arm in a lateral position, but in scoliotic curves like these, sometimes the AP C arm is very helpful. So uh, this is the same patient. Now, again, the right of the screen is right of the patient and the left, uh, I apologize. The right of the screen is the left side of the patient. So it is a left side uh, approach. The concavity is towards the left side. And uh, entering the disc can be a challenge in such scoliotic curves because it can be closed on the concave side and open on the convex side. So finding the way through and not entering into the bodies with your blunt uh, uh, spreaders is very important. Otherwise you could end up with a partial corpectomy and you lose the advantage that you typically get with this uh, approach. So you put in the spreader, I'm sorry. You put in the spreader, you open it up, and that kind of creates a nice rectangular space. That's the trial and that's the cage. You wanna go as far laterally on the other end, but not too posteriorly at the other end. This is eventually how it looked like. Uh, this patient underwent a five level OLEF from L1 to S1 and T11 to S1 from the back with iliac fixation with a good uh, uh, correction of the sagittal and coronal uh, alignment. This is another patient. Now this one had uh, L45 grade one spondylolisthesis with prior laminectomy. And this patient also had uh, metastasis of prostate cancer. Uh, you can see the sclerotic metastasis here, but the rest of the body at all the levels was very osteopenic. So listhesis, if you're trying to open it up and uh, you want to try and reduce some of it, you're always worried about the purchase of screws in these uh, at, in, in these um, deformities. Prior laminectomy would have made it very difficult for us to get a good direct decompression from the back. So we decided to do an indirect decompression in this patient. This is how it looked intraoperatively. That's the L45 disc over here. That's completely collapsed. There's some vacuum in there, some sclerosis of the end plates with listhesis. This is how it looked after the oblique uh, approach where we put in the cages. You can see partial reduction of the spondylolisthesis. This is the AP right after the OLIP approach. And then I put in percutaneous screws at all three levels. This is how it looked on the lateral view before putting in the rod. You can still see there is still a grade one listhesis there. And um, then I put cement through the fenestrations of the screws to be able to get a better purchase. Um, and while I'm putting the rod in, if you see carefully, this L4 is gonna reduce back as the rod gets reduced. There you go. So that kind of gives a nice reduction of the spondylolisthesis. And this is how it eventually looked like. It uh, uh, opened up the L4-5 pretty well. Now prior laminectomy, you wanna be careful. You don't want to open it too much uh, because uh, there's gonna be a good amount of epidural scarring in the back and there have been occasions where uh, you could have a stretch injury on the nerve. There's too much epidural scarring just by opening up the disc from the front. Again, it's rare, but possible. Um, this is another case, prior surgery from L3 to five with good fusion, but he developed uh, listhesis and adjacent segment degeneration at the level above here. And that makes the sagittal alignment pretty um, unfavorable for him. It also has developed a little bit of scoliosis here. So we ended up doing a two level OLIP here and that really nicely regained his lordotic alignment. And I do the posterior revisions also percutaneously. Now uh, opinions might vary. You could potentially put a second rod up here and add a side to side connector or end to end connector depending on the situation. But I tried to minimize the dissection, put them all percutaneously and put a new rod in. So I removed the previous screws and rod and put in new screws through the same holes and put in a new rod at each end. So that gives me a nice opening up and straightening up of the lower doses and any scoliosis if there is. Now you have to be extremely careful to evaluate your preoperative imaging for any vascular anomalies. This is the case report that I published uh, a couple of years ago. 
the picture on the right here is the coronal CAT scan, and that just gives away the, the secret here. Uh, you can see the midline aorta, which has the calcified walls, but the IVC is in this case on the left instead of the right. And then you have the oblique right common iliac vein, which is normally the left side one that's typically oblique. And then it crosses over at the level of the renal vessels and then becomes the normal right-sided IVC. So this is a, a typical pattern of what you would encounter with a persistent left-sided IVC. It's important for, the, for you to recognize this beforehand. Now, unfortunately, we often do not have CAT scans before we do spine surgery, and we have to look for uh, the axial sections or if available, coronal sections on the MRI, which often are not available for us. But there are some telltale signs that you would want to look or have high suspicion of. So here I have all the sections. Um, so in, the, in this L5S1 segment, you see this is the the right common iliac vein, and this is the left common iliac vein. Normally, the right one is supposed to be rounded, and the left one is supposed to be flat oblique like this. So in this case, it's kind of opposite. So that kind of gives it away. Here, you can see the round bifurcated common iliac arteries and the oval vein on the right side, again over here. So that kind of confirms that you know there is a left side IVC. At L12, it kind of crosses anterior to the aorta and becomes the right side IVC beyond that as seen here. So it's important to go through all the available axial sections to rule out any vascular injuries. Now, if this patient were to have an OLIF and you go through the usual left side approach, you'll be surprised to find the vein there. It's always good to know that beforehand. It's not the end of the world if you find the vein in your exposure because right side approaches are also common and commonly done, not commonly done, but uh, known to be done. But in this case, you, if you're staying above the L5, you'll probably be safe doing a right side approach here, just because there's a wider corridor here. Now, just like that, there is uh, anomalies of what we call as double IVC as well. Now, this is a patient I did not operate. I saw him in clinic, uh, but uh, this is very important to recognize any vascular structures within the corridor. Now, this should be an open space between the aorta and the left psoas, but I see a vessel over here. And if I, when I trace it inferiorly and superiorly, uh, I realized that this was a persistent left IVC. So this patient has double IVC. And uh, this is something that you have to understand preoperatively and decide your exposures um, ahead of time accordingly. So complications with this approach, uh, I have, um, uh, brought in four papers on OLIF and uh, a couple of meta-analyses, one for ALIF and one for XLIF to try and compare. So vascular injury is the most worrisome part with any anterior approach. Uh, theoretically, they should be maximum with ALIF and minimum with XLIF since you're staying within the psoas and you should not encounter vessels here. OLIF, it has a variability of vascular uh, injury rate just because uh, most of the studies are retrospective, single center, single surgeon, oftentimes. And um, uh, it's just not well powered to find a real uh, incidence for it. So its incidence can vary between 0.3 to 2 or 3.9% uh, yeah, as well in some series. But it's going to be technically lower than ALF once we have maybe 10,000 patients in a meta-analysis. Meta um, the biggest worry with XLIF is your uh, injury to the psoas and injury to the lumbar plexus that can cause uh, hip flexion weakness or neurologic deficit. Often the lumbar plexus could involve uh, you know, injury to the nerves going towards the quadriceps, which are far more, uh, can become morbid if you end up making them weak. You could require some form of ambulatory aid like a cane or a walker, unlike uh, a foot drop where oftentimes you don't have to require that, uh, that much of help. So um, OLIF is a big draw to prevent these complications. Again, the complication rate is variable anywhere between zero to 1.2% with the OLIF approaches and ALF has 
Now, ileus, just like vascular injuries, should be most common theoretically with ALF and least common with, with XLIF. Of course, you see a little bit of variability here. You can see up to 2.9%. Now, ileus is important to understand. And at least from my experience, it's something that you will commonly see in the first few cases. And as you regain or gain more confidence, more experience, it kind of reduces. So first year of my uh, uh, experience with this technique, I had a few patients with ileus, but last year I haven't, fortunately I haven't had any patient with ileus. So um, you kind of over a period of time tend to learn what things you should do to try and minimize the injury that you're providing to the, to the bowel with your retraction. Complete muscle relaxation really helps us, is my opinion on it. You still do get some groin pain or anterior thigh numbness in a small subset of patients just because you've retracted the psoas, so you can have bruising of the psoas. Retrograde ejaculation is because of the injury to the, uh, uh, the hypogastric sympathetic plexus, most, uh, mostly seen with ALIF, but also known to occur with OLIF. Ureter injury, we saw the ureter in the earlier video. Um, it's visible, it's close to the psoas. It can potentially get injured in patients who've had prior scarring, uh, prior uh, surgery and scarring or radiation in the past. Um, and has a very low incidence, luckily, just because it's well visualized. And typically once you see it, you know uh, where it's gonna be and you can safely protect it. Subsidence has been talked about to be high with OLIF up to 4.4%. Uh, but I believe there's a lot of variability and uh, as to how you calculate subsidence because uh, unless you do a CT scan in all of your patients postoperatively, uh, there's going to be a huge amount of variability on how, how you actually define subsidence or assess subsidence. So this was about uh, OLIF above L5. L5S1 is probably an entire talk in itself, but I'll go over some basics here. Um, L5S1 naturally has significant obstacles if you're trying to reach it obliquely. Uh, obviously, there is no natural corridor between your psoas and your uh, bifurcated vessels. So there's often a need to mobilize one of these vessels out of your way to be able to reach it obliquely from either end. Of course, it might be beneficial to uh, use an access surgeon, maybe a general surgeon or a vascular surgeon in your um, hospital who can help you out with early approaches. Uh, uh, there is a higher incidence of vascular injuries when you're including L5S1 in older. So it's important to gain a significant amount of experience before you start doing or uh, start including L5S1 in your OLIF procedures. It's always um, okay in the early cases to uh, be a little bit more conservative and maybe address L5S1 posteriorly rather than anteriorly and do the other levels with the regular OLIF technique rather than risking vascular injuries, which, which can be catastrophic. Uh, transitional anatomy makes a mismatch between your bifurcations and the L5S1 level, and that can create challenges as well. So if you're dealing with an isolated L5S1 uh, pathology and you want to go anteriorly, you can make the supine ALF minimally invasive by doing a fan and steel incision and that can reduce the morbidity of it. Uh, ALF uh, for L5S1 uh, goes through the large anterior corridor over here and has better visualization. Um, and uh, for isolated L5S1, that would be a technique that I would prefer rather than taking the risk of OLIF. Uh, but OLIF, if you're doing multi-level, it's definitely advantageous. You're using the lateral position for multiple levels, including L5S1. The lateral position is known to be, or is thought to be less morbid because there is a gravity assisted retraction of the peritoneal sac. So theoretically you could have a lower uh, chance of getting paralytic ileus. And of course it's versatile. You can reach levels almost up to T12 above and down to S1 which ALIF might not be able to provide, especially at the upper lumbar levels, it can be challenging and you could require a very wide open uh, approach for it. So I describe oblique approaches to L5S1 through three different corridors. The main or the most commonly one is the left intrabifurcation technique, which is most commonly described. 
So you're going from the left side. So your left side is up, you're in lateral position and you're going under the bifurcation, uh, just like described by uh, Dr. Woods and Dr. Hines in their study. You could stay lateral to the bifurcation and stay on the left side and go at what we call the left pre-source technique or ATP or anterior resource technique. Or you could go from the right. Now, going from the right, of course, requires the experience to be close to the IVC and dealing with retraction or mobilization of the IVC if needed. But that can be a potentially good approach if you're staying in front of the source and lateral to the bifurcation here after adequate experience has been, uh, has been gained, which is important. Now, I won't go through a whole lot of details about the uh, L5S1 exposures, uh, just because it's an entire talk in itself. I'll go over some of the basic complications that we need to look for when you're including L5S1. So I have these four studies, unfortunately, they're all retrospective, and they're probably single center studies and have minimum follow-up of maybe six to 12 months. Uh, so they're not extremely high power, high strength uh, evidence, but it's important to recognize the importance here. The vascular injuries increase from 2.9 to 4.3% when L5S1 is included, as far as uh, the, the paper from Dr. Woods is concerned. Of course, there's a variability on how much or which injuries you actually report. Ileus can also be higher if L5S1 is approached, of course, because it's a large, uh, longer amount of operative time that could be required and as high as 6% has been reported with the L5S1 inclusion. Uh, groin and anterior thigh symptoms can also be much more frequent and up to 20% um, when L5S1 is included. Subsidence is also known to be slightly higher, up to 6% when L5S1 is included, likely because Oftentimes you're uh, relying a lot on C-arm when you're doing the end plate preparation. And uh, some of the preparation may not be under direct vision, so that can make you curate more and end up performing uh, or undergoing subsidence. So this is my talk. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I'll, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. And um, there you go. Thank you, Chirag. Thank you, Chirag, for the wonderful lecture. Uh, I mean, a lot of you learning. Uh, just a few questions. Uh, so do you use an intraoperative CT or an OR? I do not. I believe um, in uh, if I'm trying to visualize everything and if there's not an extensively bad amount of deformity, uh, just using the lateral C-arm and AP for confirmation helps me a lot. In fact, uh, there are hardly five or six shots that I take for the anterior part of the procedure. Of course, when I'm doing the percutaneous pedicle screws from the back, there's way more radiation. Now, O-arm will require you to add a little bit more of your um, operative time. And there is a likelihood that uh, depending on where your reference frame is, if you're far high in the lumbar spine, and if your reference frame is on the iliac, the farther high you get, there's a potential of uh, reduced accuracy. But I do get it that, you know, you can use the probe to identify how much discectomy you have performed. And it can be advantageous. It can be extremely great in... Uh, in early cases when you're trying to get an orientation of the oblique trajectory. Thank you, Chirag, for that. The other thing is, do you think that the ability to practice MIS is better with XLIF compared to OLIF, or do you think OLIF is better? Now, there are two, I would say there are two groups of surgeons here that will have differing opinions. Now, as you know, I was uh, initially trained in India and there's a good amount of tuberculosis in India. And uh, you do use the anterolateral thoracic abdominal approach. So I started off learning the anterolateral technique first and uh, then went on to OLIF. But uh, in the United States, uh, XLIF or direct lateral uh, was far more common, especially in the late 2000s and early 2010s. So people migrating from XLIF to OLIF will have a different perspective here 
as compared to um, uh, migrating from an anterolateral open technique to older. So, um, so basically, if you are used to working through tubes, like if you're doing a minimally invasive transforamal antibody fusion from the back, the T lift, uh, where you are basically used to using the tubular retractors, you're going to find the tubular retractors far more minimally invasive. And uh, that's the technique for X lift where you use those dilators. You could end up with an incision as small as one or one and a half inch for each level. And same for uh, the, the tube based retractor systems that you could use for levels above L5 with, uh, with OLIF that you could potentially lower down your incision length to maybe one, one and a half inches as well. And using a blade based retractor will probably require you to have at least maybe a two inch incision. So yes, there is a possibility of uh, being more minimally invasive with uh, XLIF or tube-based OLIF as against a blade-based OLIF. Um, it depends on what, what risk you wanna take. You wanna take the risk of visceral and vascular injuries versus you wanna take the risk of lumbar plexus injuries in your patient and based on your experience. So it depends on the experience of each surgeon is, is what I think. And do you think technically you can use tube-based uh, retractors for OLIF as well? Yes, but they've been described only from for levels above L5 and that to only on the left side. So you do need a wide corridor naturally to be able to go through it. Um, with the blade-based retractor, you can create a corridor even if there is none by carefully doing a blunt dissection and using those blade-based retractors to hold on to that position. Thank you, Chiral, for that. And the other one is, what about the correction of deformities? If you want to compare x versus Olive, what do you think uh, Olive does have a better advantage is it for correction of larger deformities? Um, well, they're kind of similar in that regard. There are pros and cons of both. Um, as, uh, as we just talked that x could potentially have smaller incisions but you could require multiple incisions just because the incisions are small to reach all the levels. In deformity surgery, you probably have to put at least four or five cages in front. So if you're reaching four or five levels in the front, uh, the smaller the incision, the, the more likely you require multiple incisions. And with XLIF, you cannot reach L5S1. So L5S1 is the foundation of any uh, construct that you would use for deformity. And if you cannot include that and you would want to use a posterior technique for L5S1, that's a big disadvantage for XLIF. OLIF will allow you multiple levels, including L5S1, with varying degrees of challenges with each patient's anatomy and different set of risks involved. But uh, both of them are kind of similar in the way the cages go in. They go in a, a coronal direction and uh, they allow you to uh, you know, open up the spaces, uh, this space is pretty high to improve the lower doses and also correct the scoliosis depending on which direction you go. And uh, what about orientation difficulties? For example, I have, uh, because you either you go posterior or you go extreme lateral. So when you go in oblique, do you think uh, surgeons have this problem of orientation issues? Absolutely, absolutely. And that's where if you have the resources of an OLIF with navigation, that could help. But typically, it's very common in your early cases that you could potentially uh, be in an oblique trajectory and end up with your cage going too far posterior on the other side and injuring the lumbar plexus on the other side. So the orthogonal maneuver is important and relying on your C-arm or imaging while you're placing the trials and cages is extremely important in the early cases. Thank you, Chirag, for that. The other concern is uh, regarding the, I mean, it's not regarding the particular procedure itself, regarding the options for fusion. Fusion technologies, have you used uh, bone morphogenic protein 7 or something like that nowadays, or is it declining? I personally don't like to use BMP just because there's been so much controversy. Uh, it, um, and uh, I use um, allograft bone chips or cancellous bone. And I use a jam shitty needle and uh, aspirate bone marrow from the vertebral bodies itself. And that I think improves my quality of my fusion pretty well. But of course, uh, 
you know, packing bone chips versus packing some different kind of bone substitutes which stay in the cage better could be more advantageous, more convenient. Of course, added costs are involved. Um, um, BMP is a good way to guarantee your fusion in patients you may think might not fuse well, like in uh, uh, older uh, age groups where there's significant osteoporosis or smokers or um, um, people with, uh, with the difficulty healing fusions that you anticipate based on their medical comorbidities. There you can use some of these substitutes and BMP would uh, definitely uh, kind of guarantee your fusion in most of the cases with the added cost. Thank you, Chirag, for that. I think that's all the questions that we have, Chirag. Thank you for coming and delivering this fantastic lecture. A lot of new learning and especially we got a lot of new insight into the differences and the advantages of Olive compared to XLIF or any other kind of procedure. Thank you for joining in. No problem. That, that, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, again, I'll be open to any questions if anyone would like to reach out to me. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Rob.